So the reading that's set for today comes from Luke's Gospel, and it's the account of the walk to Emmaus, uh, a story that's told very, very briefly in Mark's Gospel also. Luke's resurrection story ends with the many women who go to see the disciples, tell them they've seen the empty tomb, and we're told the disciples thought that what the women said was nonsense, and they did not believe them. So the reading. On that same day, two of Jesus's followers were going to a village named Emmaus, about 11 kilometres from Jerusalem, and they were talking to each other about the things that had happened. As they talked and discussed, Jesus himself drew near and walked alongside them. They saw him, but somehow they did not recognise him. Jesus said to them, what are you talking about to each other as you walk along? They stood still with sad faces. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have been happening there the last few days? What things? he asked. The things that happened to Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. This man was a prophet and was considered by God and by all the people to be powerful in everything he said and did. Our chief priests handed him over to be sentenced to death, and he was crucified. And we had hoped that he would be the one who was going to set Israel free. Besides all that, this is now the third day since it happened. Some of the women in our group surprised us. They went at dawn to the tomb, but could not find his body. They came back, saying that they had seen a vision of angels, who told them that he was alive. Some of our group went to the tomb and found it exactly as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, How foolish you are! How slow you are to believe everything the prophet said! Was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and then to enter his glory? And Jesus explained to them what was said about himself in all the scriptures, beginning with the books of Moses and the writings of all the prophets, as they came near the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they said to him, saying, Stay with us, the day is almost over, and it is getting dark. So he went in to stay with them. He sat down to eat with them, took the bread, said the blessing, and he broke the bread and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognised him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, Wasn't it like a fire burning in us when he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? They got up at once and went back to Jerusalem, where they found the eleven disciples gathered together with the others and saying, The Lord is risen indeed, he has appeared to Simon. The two then explained to them what had happened to them on the road and how they had recognised the Lord when he broke the bread. It's a marvellous piece of uh, story writing because Luke, in this account of the two disciples on the walk to Emmaus, is able to retell the resurrection story. How the women went to the tomb, how they went to tell the disciples, how the disciples didn't believe them. And now, in a way that's a bit like when Jesus appeared in the upper room, as we heard in John's Gospel two weeks ago, he's also appeared to Simon, something that Paul talks about later in his letters. Wasn't it like a fire within us when he was talking to us, the disciples say? And it's a very interesting story again, isn't it? And there are many, many parallels with our own lives. Here are two people consumed by what has happened to them. Quite rightly so, completely understandably so. Disappointed, I mean, in grief for the loss of Jesus and all that he stood for, but the potential and their own ideas that this is what Jesus had come to do. We had thought, they said, that he was the one who was going to set Israel free. How? By some military action, by some force of aggression, by some mighty powerful miracle that would convince the whole world that God was indeed in their presence. We know that Jesus in his own lifetime was asked many times, give us a sign, show us something make us believe. And always the response was, well, it, it, it won't make any difference. 
I can show you these things, but you'll always fall back on your own preconceptions and your own desires. And so again, as I say, understandably and forgivably, those two people were consumed by their loss of Jesus in physical form and the horrendous situations of his death, but also because of that disappointment of what they hoped would happen. We had hoped. Jesus explains to them about his own destiny, his own purpose. And he doesn't use some proof texts from the Old Testament. He doesn't cherry pick the odd bit. He talks about the entire book of what we call the Old Testament, the book of Moses and the writings of all the prophets. Because what is that story about? It's about God coming to a people and seeking that they would be people who would dedicate themselves to God. People who would live in this world, interact with one another, go about their business, but have their hearts and their minds and their bodies and their souls solely focused on God. Consumed by an overriding awareness that God is always, always with them and that God loves them always and everywhere. And that whatever happens in life, the good things and the bad, God is always there. And we've got a beautiful parallel, haven't we, in these people walking to Emmaus. Jesus walks alongside them and they do not know he is there. But to their great credit, of course, they do some important things. One is that when Jesus says to them, so what's all this about them? And they say, well, how are you the only person who hasn't heard? They could have got all very dismissive and uppity, quite angry and dismissive, as you'll find when you interact with people when they're hurting and you ask them to explain their grief. They feel annoyed at you. They want to reach out and lash out um, and be upset in your presence to demonstrate how hurt they've been. But we hear how they stand there with sad faces and they explain what has happened with a childlike honesty. This has all happened, and this is why we are sad. And that's an important lesson for each of our conversations with God. To not justify ourselves, but to simply be in God's presence and say, this is why I am sad. This is why I am distressed. Now, it would be great if we have the spiritual maturity to take that one step forward and say, this is why I'm distressed, this is why I'm sad, but I recognise that that is my own personal world. And I live in my own personal world, so it's no surprise that it's the biggest thing on my horizon. But it isn't big in terms of the world, and it isn't big in terms of everybody else's problems and everybody else's joys. There is a world of people out there going through tremendous highs, we hope, as well as tremendous lows. Life is as diverse and infinitely rich as the number of people on this planet. And our own concerns and our own fears are precisely that. And like these two people on the road to Emmaus, they may well be justified, they may well be explicable. But should they be so all-consuming? What Jesus teaches the disciples on the road to Emmaus when he talks, explaining all that was said to him in what we refer to as the Old Testament is a relationship of trust. Nowhere is Jesus saying to them, this is all perfectly fine and it's great and you shouldn't be upset. But he is explaining God's purpose and God's purposes are very often not ours. And in that sentence, we explain the big mistake that we all make all the time. We want God's purposes to be ours. We had hoped that he would be the one to set Israel free. We had hoped. There are many things that you and I today could hope for, would wish for, would want, desire. But that doesn't mean it's God's will. That's our will. And rather than bend God to our own approach, the path to spiritual maturity the place where the assurance of the Holy Spirit is most likely to be found is when we forget self and follow Jesus, when we understand that it is about putting ourselves on the back burner, 
The words of the great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul and your strength, and love your neighbour as yourself, embody that very sense that everything that is so self-consuming about ourselves needs not to be. It doesn't mean it goes away. It doesn't mean it gets more palatable. But God's will is for us to look and to see God. When the disciples got back to Jerusalem, they told the two on the walk to Emmaus, the, the Lord is risen indeed, he's appeared to Simon. So yet another person, and we had from John in the last two weeks, Mary, I have seen the Lord. Thomas, my Lord and my God. These are people who've experienced God. And when that happens, truly there is something above and beyond everything else. It's not measured on the same scale. It's not more joy than you've ever had. It's not more grief than you could ever bear. It's a completely different thing. It is coming home. It is being the people we were made to be. Finding our true place in the universe with the God who made it. Finding ourselves to be at peace in the presence of the God who loves us always and everywhere. It is a marvellous place if we can get to, to echo the words of a song written by Matt Redman. Blessed be your name, the verse goes. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. And blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. To have that sense of praising God always and everywhere is to receive the gift that Jesus truly came to give, which was not about seeing him in physical form, looking at the miracles and thinking, isn't that wonderful? Hearing his preaching and being inspired. It is to come into that close and personal relationship with God, to know to the uttermost that each one of us is loved so much that God will always, always be with us. For that, beyond all other things, is our strength and our stay. Another time during the coronavirus pandemic, when so many people are feeling a unity with one another, with a sense of shared suffering, even if that's looking at the grief of other people who have lost people who have died, or through to the much less important issues of minor social infringement, the lack of ability to do the things we like to do, being in lockdown. All of these things can seem all-consuming and fueled by the fact that so many of our brothers and sisters around the world are sharing in that. It can indeed seem all-consuming. But what Jesus came to show us was that God was always, always with us, that God walks alongside us, even as we complain, even as we are angry, even as we suffer. God is always, always with us. And like a small child, when we blurt out our sufferings, God says to us, what do you feel? Tell me, tell me your sufferings. Explain to me how it is that you are so upset. And God will listen and God will continue to walk with you always.